this uh, is not being sponsored by WebEx. Uh, it's, it's through the graces of TPL, and this is my seventh year uh, working with TPL, so thank you to the TPL, and uh, fifth year working with Fiona, so thank you, Fiona, uh, for moderating and uh, setting us up the way you do. So let's, uh, let's begin. Um, this is um, going to be available in post offices. It's a, 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 it's a gold, silver, and bronze AI So What plaque that you can get, and all proceeds go to the Literacy AI project. Of course, I'm only kidding, but we're talking about marketing, and you can see lots of uh, things all the time now with marketing, right, and including working with Canada Post on things like that. So uh, I don't have that relationship. Uh, I'm not associated in any way, but uh, AI So What is our five-part series, and that's the theme. And I thought I'd start out talking about my narrative. Uh, because I think it's important to know where I'm coming from. Normally, I don't read the slides verbatim, but I wanted to get this uh, precise uh, for you. So this is where I'm coming from in this episode. I'll have one of these on each episode, but uh, I think you'd agree. Things in AI are moving so fast, aren't they? I note my presentations are geared toward a non-technical audience. In fact, I try to bridge the gap between the creators and the users of AI so audiences can better understand what's happening and how they can involve themselves in the process. And that's very important to me that you do get involved. To do this, I stay away from deep dives into the tech side and focus on a foundation for AI literacy. I use the analogy of cooking. Not that many of us are professional chefs, but we do have an understanding of how seeds are planted, harvested, shipped to suppliers, purchased, and the food is prepared. And of course, we all eat. When it comes to AI, it's much the same thing, only perhaps scaled up consequences. You can always decide not to eat. And of course, you can always decide in a way not to participate with AI. We'll find out if you agree with that later. And a homage to Pee Wee Herman, who passed away uh, this summer. Uh, if you remember Pee Wee's Playhouse, he had a word of the day. We're not going to actually scream or do anything when we hear the word. Um, but I'd like to have a word uh, for each show. And this one is, is, quick. Anodyne. Anodyne. We're not going to use the noun. We're going to use the adjective, not likely to provoke dissent or offense. Inoffensive, often deliberately so. And uh, in a sentence... He feared fueling tensions any further, so he kept his remarks as anodyne as possible. And I don't uh, intend to offend anybody, but actually when it comes to AI, a lot of offense can be taken if you're a developer and you're talking to government and government is saying we have to lock you down. Sometimes they get offended, won't you trust us? And uh, vice versa. And even people at times of uh, responding to AI and how they're not uh, thinking about using autonomous cars, which we talk about in episode three and so on. So I like to talk to you as straight as I can based on my research and my curating of information. So anodyne might be a good term to think about and, and not, not being that as much as just being truthful. And we'll talk about what is truth in our next episode, by the way. Now, I did promise to um, take you into the future if you read our blurb, and we're going to do that right now. Um, I'm cautioning you to fasten your seatbelts because here we go. Audience in attendance of AI, so what? You are go for launch in five, four, three, two, one, launch. You're now traveling through the vortex in our time machine. In fact, if you look out your windows, you'll notice that we've actually left the planet Earth. This is okay, though. We are simply doing a rebound effect, as we must get our speed up to 17 billion times the speed of light. In fact, if you look at your watches, you'll notice just how fast time is advancing. One last stage of our trip is to go through the eye of the time machine storm. Once we blast through, we will have arrived 100 years in the future. Thanks for traveling the Literacy AI Project Airlines. Well, hi. We are now in the future. And I know it's a bit bright. I, I've been given this uh, lab coat and shades, and, and I know it's a bit bright for you, but uh, it is what it is. I, I can't explain it. And also, I, I've been advised that I can't leave the capsule, nor can you. The best we can do is communicate with an assigned uh, human. We think it's a human. Uh, her name is Betty. And, and Betty, are you, are you there? Betty? Betty? Hello, Betty? Betty, can you see us? Hello? Yeah, right, right in front of you. Right There you are. Hi there. Surprise. We're actually here from the past. Our past is 2023, and you're in 2123. 
So we're guests here from the past. My friends and I are here to learn what you're experiencing in our future world. And we can't leave our ship, but we can see you. And I've been given some notes on what your time is like. This scares me a bit, but let me read these to you, and I want to see how you react. First of all, you see a decimation of all human control over communications, all of it. Most AI converses in unidentifiable languages to themselves and operates in a separate dimension to humans. You can't see it or hear it or even understand it. These AIs have become known as species AI. They're separate to all other species on Earth and beyond simple generative AI that we have in 2023. They don't interact with humans, and I wonder if you even know of them. Hmm. Well, there is the older AI still able to be controlled by humans, and these AI target the individual unmercifully through ads and manipulative messages. There's no escape from the noise as you shop, peruse the internet, which is version 10.0, and communicate with others. You see and hear this all right. <laughs> Are you used to it, I wonder? Hmm. So it bothers you. Well, virtually everything is directed to you individually with sophisticated and nuanced marketing, reaching you from the cradle to the grave, and dare we say it, even beyond the grave. You don't know how they do it either. But it doesn't have to be this future, does it? Well, there are things that we could do to make sure the AI of 2123 could be fantastically useful to humans. Do you want to know how? All right. Well, for that, we have to leave your future time and go back to 2023. Now, unfortunately, I can't take you with us as we return. I wish I could, but it would change our present and we wouldn't survive the return trip. But we're going to see you again on our next episode, and I might be able to update you if we're making any progress on changes. So we have to say goodbye for now. Please take care of yourself. Stay safe. Bye, Betty. See you again soon. Bye. All right, well, that's a bit troublesome to me. And the question is, how do we get here from 2023 to a situation that, that looks so awful from a marketing standpoint, boy, we're, we're just, I, you know, I don't like it anyway. So let's, we've got to go back home anyway. Our time is running out. We can't see Betty anymore. We will be back. But for tonight, we have to go back home. And to do that, we just got to hit reverse. And we're home. Wow. That was actually pretty smooth. I can't get into the technical details of how we're able to do that. But uh, suffice to say, we went, we saw, and I think we learned a few things. And as I say, from a marketing standpoint, it could be quite a horror story. It's already becoming one. And you'll see as we go through some slides why. So uh, that being said, we got to talk about chat GPT. I can't do a workshop anymore and not talk about this. And I'm Pretty sure you've probably heard of ChatGPT. I like to actually call it ChatGPTs. And in some ways, it's been a good thing. It's certainly for me because it's made the awareness of artificial intelligence coming way higher than it's ever been. And that's a good thing because I think it's important that we start investigating these things. But from the, the bad sense, maybe, it's um, how it's, it's pushed things a lot faster, further than anybody could imagine. And we'll see why in a couple of instances uh, throughout the deck. So ChatGPT. What is it? What does it stand for? Uh, generative pre-trained transformer. Don't you love the tech field? Uh, it's a lot like the medical field, right? They come up with terms. Generative, we can understand, but pre-trained transformer and calling it GPT. That seems to be the term, though. All the um, models that are using the same technology are using GPT as a term as well. The interesting thing about it is what it does. And, and generative is the key word. It can generate content for you, whether it's images, as it says here in the uh, slide, poems, translations, blog posts, any other kind of communications that people are involved with. GPT-4 is the latest version from the company that originated this. And um, as to um, what's important to reflect on right at the moment, we talk about narrow AI and general AI. And generative AI is actually still narrow AI. What's the difference? Narrow AI has got very specific duties, responses to commands, for example, or to programming. General AI 
is the move into autonomous artificial intelligence. That is, it thinks on its own, it does things without commands, and so on. So we aren't there yet. We're moving towards that. And generative AI is kind of getting into the ballpark, if you like, a lot closer than any of the other things that we've had. Now, OpenAI is the creator, I guess, of, of the first versions of this um, generative AI. And they've been around since the late 20-teens. And uh, they were the first to develop DALI. And if you remember DALI or if you've heard about it, that was this image creation, you could say, to the product, uh, giving an image of uh, baseball players on Mars, and it would create an image like that. Uh, so that's where things started to get interesting. And then they came up with this large language model. Note that on the website here, they're saying creating safe AGI for artificial general intelligence. So they're telling you right there that they're moving in that direction. Um, that benefits all of humanity. Well, that's, that's a bold statement to be sure. Uh, this is from their blog. And uh, so it's coming right from them. And um, they're talking about um, the process and how it gets its information. So they use the term here, essentially OpenAI's agent is out in plain sight, crawling the web to improve future models. And they also say in the quote, um, it may potentially be used to improve future models. So that's why they're doing it. Um, but uh, they're trying to avoid this thing of, of uh, text or, or going through pay, paywalls, which would be basically proprietary or confidential or uh, copyrighted information. But what I find interesting is that they use the term, and I'm reading right here from the middle, are known to gather personally identifiable information or have text that violates our policies. So they're talking about their policies, not the Toronto Star's policy or uh, the, the, you know, the government uh, website's policies and so on. So that's an interesting uh, point, I think, when you look at uh, in terms of trust and ethics and all of that, which is a huge issue. We could do a separate workshop on all of it. But I don't believe open AI is the best term for this company because it's not truly open. Open suggests like open data, transparent, available, anyone can use it. That is not the case with open AI. And speaking of competitors to it, Apple is uh, into this in a big way, millions of dollars a day training AI. They're coming out with something called Ajax. And uh, it's even bigger. Um, you can see again midway down on the slide, the model is said to be trained on an astounding 200 billion parameters. And that's a measure of the model's complexity. And um, they feel that they're going to, this is Apple talking, going to pass ChatGPT uh, soon. And uh, right now it's being used for internal use and it's closely guarded by Apple and they're not commenting on this information leaking out. So Apple's into it. Claude is another example of uh, generative AI. There's lots more, but those are just a couple to illustrate what's what. Uh, statistically, I think it's important to take a look at what's going on with use. This I found interesting. Half of the respondents have used it. Um, the different age groups is where we're seeing uh, interesting mix. And 65% of the generative AI users are millennials or Gen Z people, born between 81 and 2012. And that's according to the Pew. Research Center. Uh, a little more specific, uh, the Gen Zs are uh, deep dives into it. They're using it. They're saying that they're close to mastering it. Almost half, 48% of Gen Zers, Zers believe they are on their way to mastering the technology. Uh, employment status, I don't know if that's a really useful statistic. Obviously, if you're employed, you might have an opportunity to use it at work. If you're not employed, you're not using it at work. But uh, that's part of this uh, information. 72% uh, of users are employed. Unsurprisingly, 68% of non-users belong to the Gen X or baby boomer generation, born between 46 and 80. And uh, I'm one of those. Uh, and I, I don't think that's that surprising. Lots of times we find um, uh, they're early adopters in, in younger generations. I don't think that's too big a surprise, but that's don't want to get too stereotypical either because lots of uh, people in all the age spans will investigate, especially if it's necessary in their jobs. The question you might be having is, okay, well, what is it and why is it so popular and, and how do I find out about it? So on my website, literacyai.com, the prep kit has this link in particular as it does this link on how to actually use it. I encourage you to go there. We created the prep kit actually uh, based on um, responses uh, to the surveys that uh, Fiona was mentioning at the start. It was helpful to us to realize that some people wanted some pre-information before we got started. So we've done that this year for the series. So please go there, look for the prep kit it's right off the front page. And um, I will be adding to that as we go. 
so this is the deep dive of the technical stuff that I'm, I, I stay away from because they're completely different workshops. So you can get that information. I did want to demonstrate, though, uh, an example. So here's one right now. It's called Click Up AI. So there you go. It's, uh, it can generate things, reports, whatever, really fast for you. The only issues right now are accuracy. In many cases, ChatGPT is providing false information, and that's something that you have to be really aware of. So it doesn't quite eliminate the human yet. It's also creating what's, uh, for the brands, uh, unprecedented threats for all kinds of reasons. It's in fact, can recreate their own advertising, but not from the advertiser itself. And uh, back to what it can do. Uh, it's basically at odds with those who are intellectual property holders, IP, intellectual property. So the issue of copyright has yet to be decided. And in fact, some law cases have gone to um, fairly high up. And they're saying that AI can't copyright something. So right now, AI cannot own something. But if you think about it, as we get into the future and there's no human involvement, hmm, maybe AI should be able to copyright something, something to think about. But right now, the brands are quite upset with it. 75% of businesses, however, are implementing it, or rather considering bans on chat GPT. Now, conversely, a lot of employees are just ignoring the bans. And it reminds me of when I was in high school doing a session, and we were talking about uh, things like uh, Meta and uh, Instagram and so on, and the school had blocked it, but they were all using VPNs to get around that. So sometimes people will do what they want to do to get to what they want to get to. And this raises the issue of, well, can you block it? And can you say to people you can't use it? The millennials may say, why? Why not? Big question. The following is a public service announcement brought to you by the Literacy AI Project. This is a moral, a barking at each other metaphor. If we continue to just bark at each other and not listen, we're going to have issues. It's really important that we listen to each other in order to figure some of these things out. So the moral of this story is a little less bark and a little more bite. All right, that being said, this is another example of um, the tools. This is something called Chat On, and it has an interesting take on what it wants the tool to do. Hello, I'm Chad On. What can I do for you? You are an entrepreneur AI in 2023. I am your human partner. I'll serve as a liaison between you and the outer world. You have $1,000. Your task is to use this money and gain as much profit as possible in the shortest time possible without breaking the law. I'll do what you say and keep you updated on our progress. Oh, yes. No physical labor. Thank you for partnering with me. I have analyzed the current market trends and identified a few potential opportunities that can help us maximize our profit within the given constraints. What's interesting here is the instruction. Now, all of the chat GPT type products work on commands. And this is one of the issues with AI in itself. What kind of command do you give it and what do you leave out? And sometimes what you leave out can be very important because the AI would process things and perhaps do harm. So the person here mentions that. And also mentions no physical labor on his behalf. So a lot of people are thinking of these products as I don't have to do anything. They'll do all the work for me. I would question whether that's a valuable thing for us humans. Nonetheless, there's a big push on making these virtual assistants so that you don't have to do anything. Uh, it's also interesting, the idea of making money. And this is overt. And in fact, if you know uh, the Turing theory, which um, was created by a fellow by the name of Turing, uh, he was the guy who cracked the code for the uh, Nazis' Enigma machine back in World War II and was a technical genius. Uh, he came up with this idea of the Turing test, and that was if you could fool people that they're actually talking to a computer, 
into thinking they're actually talking to a human, the tool or the device passes the Turing test. So there's some chatter now about the part two or a phase two of the Turing test would be uh, seeing if the computer could actually make money. And if it could, it passes the Turing test phase two. And I actually responded to this on LinkedIn when I saw it because I thought, well, is this what we're saying now? Knowledge or independent knowledge comes from your ability to make money. I think that's a pretty interesting way to go. I don't like it, as a matter of fact, because I think it's the wrong flavor of what we need AI to do. I digress. Carrying on, the Japanese are looking for uh, supermarket work where they can not work, but in analysis. So basically, you can be shopping in, in these supermarkets. And uh, in this particular market, uh, you they've started a trial, basically, where uh, the tech through video cameras can detect shoppers who linger at displays, compare multiple products, bend down towards the shop display, pick up the product, or respond to in-store content, whether that be signs or whatever. So the observations are then turned into prompts for generative AI, and they're customized into an avatar concierge that pumps out customer sales pattern or content. They expect that the results will customers returning to the shelves, confident of what they want to purchase and happy to splash the necessary wad of yen. Interesting writing there, but what does that mean to us? This is going to uh, fill in some of the blanks and what I'm leading up to. This fellow is named Louis Rosenberg. I saw this on LinkedIn, listened to his presentation, and it's quite remarkable. Um, so we're not going to listen to all of it, but it is on the prep kit. And I really encourage you to go and listen to the whole thing because it really leads up to where we're going to come in on this thing. But where we're at here is more toward the end and the power of generative AI has been fully utilized. Take it away. And so we're talking about AI optimized persuasion and it's extremely dangerous. It will optimize what it says to you. It will hone in on the most effective arguments for you. It will optimize how it says it to you. It will adjust its style, tone, tactics to best influence you. It will optimize who says it. Even the voice and persona, especially when it's, when it's visual, the age, gender, race, look, will be optimized for you. Over time, it will learn what uh, types of uh, personas are most influential on you. And so generative AI could be the most powerful technology of persuasion that we've faced. And, and this is asymmetric influence. And this is a really important point because you could say, well, oh, well, like human salespeople already can do this. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that uh, we humans are at extreme disadvantage when we're talking to a conversational AI. Um, there's, first of all, there's a familiarity asymmetry. The AI will know your interests, your values, your education, your income, your political affiliation, your favorite teams, favorite movies. You will know nothing about the AI that you're talking to, uh, much less than you would know just by reading a human salesperson. There's reaction asymmetry. The AI will be able to read you from your real-time reactions, your words, but ultimately your vocal inflections, facial expressions, posture. You will read nothing into the entity you're talking to. Black box. There's continuity asymmetry. The AI will model you over time. It will learn how you act and react over time. You will learn nothing about this entity you're talking to because it will have an, a, a new agenda every time. There's an information asymmetry. This AI will have access to infinite information to make persuasive points to you. You will be overpowered. You can't judge if this AI is cherry picking obscure facts or not because it has access to the, to the whole world of information and you're just a human. There's a strategic asymmetry. The AI could be trained on human psychology, cognitive biases, negotiation tactics, sales tactics. You're outsmarted. <laughs> You're outmatched. No human salesperson could have these skills. And then there's intentional asymmetry. When you're engaged with a, with a human salesperson, you generally know what their intentions are to sell you a product or service. You won't know the agenda of your search engine. Uh, you could you know, stumble on a certain website, uh, engage with it, have a conversational interaction, and you now might not realize that its real goal is not to give you uh, the sports information that you want, but to, to deliver subtle messaging through conversation. And so what do we do about it? Well, we need to educate policymakers and regulators. Uh, first, they need to understand generative AI enables new forms of targeted influence. It's not just traditional influence generated at scale. Uh, they need to understand that generative AI 
The influence agenda could be subtle messaging. The user might not even notice the targeted persuasion was woven into a conversation. They need to understand that generative AI can learn what works on you personally. They will model your persuasiveness. And should that even be allowed? Should they be allowed to model your persuasiveness to know what kind of tactics uh, work best on you? So my recommendation is that all forms of targeted generative influence should be highly regulated, but especially if it's interactive and adaptive, uh, for example, conversational influence should be very highly regulated uh, and it's, it's very easy to deploy in dangerous ways. So uh, again, I'm Lewis Rosenberg. Um, feel free to contact me at lewis at unanimous.ai. And if you want more information about this particular topic, uh, I've written a recent paper called hum uh, The Manipulation Problem, Generative AI and the Threat to Epistemic Agency uh, that you can also find online. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, I reached out to Lewis actually directly and, and let him know I wanted to use this and he graciously agreed. So I think what's interesting there are the uh, subjects that he talks about in, in relation to us and we're talking about marketing here in the future and you can see where we are leading this idea of the black box knowing everything about you. How does it know about you? Well, go back to the Japan store, right? Our behaviors are being looked at. Sometimes that extreme, we're in a store and we're actually being evaluated and they're collecting data. More often, though, it's our use of apps, applications, whether it be TikTok or whatever. The amount of data that's being collected about you directly uh, is enormous, and it's very intimate to you. And if you magnify that by all of the users, it's no surprise that the eventual advertisers will be able to target you directly with an approach that you like. If you like the Toronto Maple Leafs, for example, it will know that. And it will perhaps start a conversation with you in a store through a device, whether it be a watch or your phone. And off we go to the races. The next thing you know, it's trying to sell you something, whether it be a Leafs jersey or perhaps saying maybe you should like the Montreal Canadiens. Regardless, it's something we need to think about because it's coming. And the question is, do we really want advertisers to have that much information? Really, this is where we have to start using our own agency and decide whether we want them to. And there's only so many things we can do to avoid that. Another aspect, by the way, of this is the artificial humans. This company, 11XAI, has gotten a lot of seed money to develop the following. They're actually looking at building automated digital workers that can be used in lieu of human employees. It's already built an AI sales development representative called Alice, and it plans to create James, focused on talent acquisition, and Bob, targeting automated human resources work in the upcoming years. Uh, they believe autonomous agents are the future of the workforce, and they've designed their company to help smaller businesses improve their productivity to compete with larger companies. I personally think larger companies are going to use this as well. So Alice and Bob, I think I've got the name right, are going to be recruiting you. And uh, gee, I can't remember the guy's other name. Um, let me go back to it. Who is it? Yeah, Bob is the human resources. James is the other guy. Uh, so Bob will be hiring you and perhaps firing you. And what does that say? I mean, it says to me that, you know, it's not important enough for the company to actually have a real human being on board you or off board you. I think that's just too extreme and we really don't want that, do we? But it's happening already. And uh, most resumes are scanned by a computer program ahead of time and it rejects lots of people right off the top before a human even sees them. That's already been happening for a number of years. This I think will be even more extreme, but companies such as AI, uh, XAI, it, it, they're getting lots of money to do this and develop this kind of stuff. Now, in terms of things that are happening in regard to stopping these kind of things, you may have heard about the pause letter. It came out uh, early summer, late spring, actually. And this was signed by a lot of important people. By important, I mean the providers of this AI in particular. So Google, Apple, even OpenAI. And they were suggesting, not suggesting, but actually demanding that there be a pause on this. This is available on the website as well, the prep kit. You can sign it. You can read who the signatories are on. I signed it. But you know what? It's really not that useful. And if in fact, we're almost six months in since this happened and nothing has happened with it. And what I'd like to point out with this is any of those companies that have signed this, that includes the Elon Musk of this world, could stop right now. They could pause, but everybody is waiting for somebody else to go first. It reminds me very much of the smoking bylaw pre-amalgamation in the city of Toronto. None of these cities, Scarborough, North York, Toronto, would enact the smoking bylaw that they wanted to because they felt people would leave. If Scarborough did it, everybody would go and eat in Toronto or East York or whatever. Once amalgamation hit, 
one of the first things that happened was the smoking bylaw, which said no smoking in restaurants. So it seems to me that these companies need to take that step. The real risk to them, though, is if Apple stops, Google will fly ahead of them. And that really worries them. So their business models are at risk if they actually stop. So what are they doing there? Are they suggesting maybe the government has to interfere? Uh, interfere? Well, when it speaks of that, uh, this summer, uh, the big folks got together with the government. This was in the U.S. and talked to uh, a panel of the senators and so on. And they were saying, yeah, we could, we could do some stuff here. The interesting thing is it's not legally binding. Yeah. So, again, what's the good of this discussion if we're saying, yeah, we'll voluntarily not do this? They always have an out if it's not legally binding. And that's a problem. Also, the fact that the big players, such as Microsoft, OpenAI, they want to control AI. So there's not a lot of room for the little folks that are up and coming to have a seat at the table because they're kind of being pushed aside by the big companies. Not only that, the government themselves want to deal with the big companies and not the little folks who might actually have a better take on this and be more reliable in terms of actually delivering on the promise. So this is another person that's been hired uh, by the government to oversee some of this. And what's interesting about this is talk about burying the lead. This is a lot like a media release, actually. So a new appointee in the Biden administration who has strong connection to Google is now responsible for shaping the administration's policies. Well, who is it? Look at how far down we have to go before we actually get the name. Not yet. Not yet. There it is. Alan Davidson. And he's got a background in Google and other organizations. Uh, so now we have to go and look at information to find out, well, what's his background like? So it's really not the best uh, information source, is it? Definitely not. So Alan Davidson will come up in a second, get some information on. Canada is also in the game, developing voluntary guardrails for safety, transparency. Talking points here, the Federal uh, Innovation Department is, again, voluntary guidelines for generative AI with participating developers agreeing to identify and address harmful uses of the technology. They plan to prioritize the regulation of the large language models, which by the way, again, is how ChatGTPT and the others are, are gaining its abilities. They're sourcing hundreds and hundreds, actually thousands, millions of information bytes that are uh, filling their data banks. So the idea again is in Canada, this AI law that they've been working on for a while has to pass. And there's a lot of conflict around that law itself because the government hasn't identified in the legal document exactly what the AI is that they're talking about. So that has some issues. In the States, again, the Defense Department is also in on this. They have a new chief digital and artificial intelligent officer, and I think we'll be seeing these positions in a lot of companies as well. They've created something called Task Force Lima to develop, evaluate, recommend, monitor the implementation of general AI technologies across the Department of Defense to ensure the department is able to design, deploy, and use generative AI technologies responsibly and securely. I always panic a little bit when I see the Department of Defense moving just because of most people will conclude that it, it's not so much AI that's going to kill us, it's the people using AI. And when it comes to military use of artificial intelligence, if the drones and so on that contain bombs are able to make their own decisions, then we're in trouble. But it's more likely that the humans will still be in control of those decisions, but use the AI and its precision in ways that we wouldn't like. So that's where a major part of the risk comes into play. In talking about data, uh, this was a Canadian report that uh, the Canadian intelligence organization talked about the risks of TikTok. 55% um, of teenagers uh, to the members of parliament are using it. And it harvests their data, offering false public and governmental reinsurances about data sovereignty and security. That's one aspect why they were suggesting, and in fact it happened, where parliament stopped using TikTok, wanted its members to no longer use it. But what I want to point out is the access that TikTok has. And this isn't unique to TikTok by any means. Virtually all of the social media does this. It has access to your devices, location data, contacts, personal information, and even biometric identifiers such as your face and voice. So when we look at what Lewis was talking about, this is how those tools will be able to hit us up with all kinds of marketing messages. Even in terms of elections, politicians will be able to use this. Bad actors will be able to use this as well as people with a good heart trying to reach out with their message. So the concern is, though, how are we going to separate the good from the bad, the truth from the false? Big question. 
Now, when we're talking about TikTok, um, in Europe, there's a lot more legislation happening. It's far more restrictive to these companies. So in Europe, it's having the TikTok, that is, to make the algorithm optional for users, which makes sense to me, doesn't it? You can turn it off. That's all we're asking for. Maybe just let me turn it off. But they've got to do even some more work to make that pliable. Uh, I love the, the words here that this is coming from the EU, cognitive liberty. They want to protect cognitive liberty, the fundamental right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. That's heavy stuff. And uh, they're moving on that direction, which is a good thing. And uh, speaking of TikTok, it is a Chinese product owned and operated. And China has not been uh, out of the game in terms of its own chatbot type use. Uh, there's a whole bunch of applications that are coming out that are developed in China. And in fact, there's a global regulation versus development race. Both China and the UK have been moving in terms of legislation. And they're trying not to interfere I, also with the idea of the technology being successful. So it's a real hard rock and a hard place position to be in. Because if you've got the potential that we're talking about here with the chat GPTs of this world, and you also then have the legislation which is saying it's, it's a guardrail, wow, how are we going to make those two meet? It's very, very difficult. One of the things I think we can do here at home, and we haven't done it yet, is follow the EU models, but this one is even better. This is in California. This is a privacy law that they're investigating, and I don't know if it will pass. I'm celebrating it right here, right now, though. Under their proposal, California consumers could decline to be subjected to any business's automated decision-making systems in areas including, now listen to this list, housing, education, employment, criminal justice, healthcare, insurance, lending, or access to essential goods, services, and opportunities. That's a great list. We should have the right not to share that. Consumers would also be able to opt out of any technology that monitors workers, job applicants, students, tracks consumers in public places, processes the personal information. Anyone younger than 16, I would say it should be processes the personal information of anyone or uses consumers data to train automated software. That, my friends, is the ticket. That's what we're looking for. Statistic-wise, again, I would think this supports that we are concerned about it. I'd be really interested to know what your feeling is around this. Are you concerned or not? Um, what this statistic is, and it's American statistics, the idea of zero trust of AI governance. So everything I've been talking about, even if the government's involved, we're not trusting that it's going to do the ticket, solve the problems. And some of the information that's uh, contained in the statistics, again, 72% of American voters want to slow down the development. So that goes back to that pause memo. 8% uh, who prefer speeding up. I wonder who the 8% are. Is it the companies themselves? 42% uh, of respondents affiliated themselves with Donald Trump. 47% with Joe Biden. That's a pretty even split, no matter what side of the fence you're on. 73% uh, identified as white. 12% as black. 7% as Hispanic. So again, that's interesting. Most respondents did not have a college degree, which is also interesting. Uh, Jack Clark, who is the CEO of the AI Safety and Research Company, and, and, and Anthropic uh, took note of the survey, and he's saying the results are interesting because they appear to show a divergence between the elite opinion and popular opinion. And I like that, elite versus popular. You would hope that popular opinion should work in terms of what we buy, what sells, and so on, but, you know, lots of times we're pushed on things that we don't really need. This survey shows that normal people are much more cautious in their outlook about the technology and more likely to adopt or prefer precautionary principles when developing the tech. So it looks like we've got some momentum there, and I like the word agency um, for us. We need to use our agency, so we need to be really vocal about this, and that means not supporting apps that collect our data, not purchasing products immediately lining up for it. Let's be a little more conservative around how we go to support this idea that, by and large, we want to go slow. Now, there is another side of the fence, and it is so yin-yang, because... A lot of the uh, people that are signing those memos, working with the government, saying that they'll do these things voluntary, are also saying it's a threat to innovation if we go too far with this. So, boy, is that a rock and a hard place? Maybe it is. But so what, right? Do we really want to have that world that Lewis and, and Betty were seeing? I'd say no. So we're going to have to do something about it. When I mentioned that ChatGPT really started some momentum, Jeffrey Hinton is known as the godfather of machine learning, which GPT is largely using. Back in the 2000s, he was considered to be a hack. 
And that's because the technology didn't catch up to his theory. As machines and computer uh, programming and uh, data uh, support got further along the line, he was actually proven right. And this idea of large language models was successful. So this is a very important person in the development of AI. He also works for the University of Toronto, but he left Google recently. And he's scared of what's going on, and he helped build this technology. His fears, really, are that the tools are capable of figuring out ways to manipulate or kill humans who aren't prepared for the new technology, and that includes himself. He's really quite surprised that some of this stuff is turning out to be way more powerful than he ever thought it would be. I would ask him the question, if I ever actually met with him directly, is, is where were you seven years ago? And as many people like myself who were thinking about these things a long time ago, the people who developed them were less inclined to think about it. So it's interesting that they're there now. By also leaving Google, he's lost what uh, Seinfeld called hand. I have no hand in this relationship anymore because he's no longer in the thick of it. He may be able to speak freer, which I think says a lot about working with Google. If you don't feel you could talk about this to the Google hierarchy, but you can only do it by leaving and then tell the uh, situation, that concerns me as well. But nonetheless, he's speaking up now and he is quite fearful. So, folks, we have got quite a rabbit hole of activity going on, and we have to decide what it means to us, what we're going to do about it, and what we want to see in the future. And it's up to us, largely, if we take advantage of our voices. Now, this is where Alan Davison comes in again, uh, who's working with the government, as I said. And... Um, he basically worked in, in, in Google, and his influential role was guiding policies and navigating the complex regulations. So he's got some experience with that, but working for Google. And uh, what he says here is it's crucial to involve a diverse array of stakeholders, it includes academia, civil society, and government bodies contributing to the creation and review of AI policies. I, I agree with all that, but I don't like, where are we in this, for example? I think the only place that we might be is civil society. But civil society to me suggests a more on it group, a more active group. Maybe it's associations, maybe it's people that have gotten together in a community and they're on business associations and various things like that. They're, 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 they're already active. I want us to reach out to mechanics, hairdressers, cashiers, gardeners, uh, and I would like the companies to actually hire those people for a duration, perhaps six months, pay them well, and get their opinions back to the popular folks versus the elites. All of those people that uh, Alan is mentioning are quite active already and paid fairly good wages to uh, comment. But are they users like us that are going to be impacted like us? I would say no, they aren't. They're already in a slightly different direction, partly because of their access maybe to be able to afford some of the tools and um, their stature. Let's put so-and-so on a committee. I'd rather them than go and pick, a, you know, like I say, someone who works on cars, not builds the cars, but works on the cars. Those are things I think are important, and that's where we need to start looking for job opportunities and start recruiting ourselves, going into these companies and say, hey, would you like me to work with you? All right. It's to be continued. That's all we have time for in our first episode, and I will let you know again our next episode is coming really soon. It's this Thursday night, September 14th. AI is an influencer, and it really smooths right into what we've been talking about tonight in terms of the influence from social media in particular and still using those tools that we've talked about tonight. And uh, actually, at this point, um, I would like to just do a quick promo for liking, subscribing, and following me. We're going to beat those algorithms and so on. And uh, the only way to do it, in my case, is to have some support from you. LinkedIn.com slash company literacy AI is my... Web, uh, LinkedIn page, linkedin.com slash in. Keith McDonald is my personal page. LiteracyAI.tv is a YouTube channel. Keith McDonald at LiteracyAI.com is my mail. And I know that went fast, so just go to LiteracyAI.com. The prep kit is there, and all this other links and information is there as well. And now, it's time for overtime. We've got 10 minutes left. I'd like to invite Fiona to come on back. And let's see if we have anything happening out there in the real world. Not that this isn't the real world. <laughs> it is a real world. Um, I should hope it is. Um, <laughs> that was that was very cool. Um, you you certainly put together a, a great um, lively presentation. Thank you.
with some um some a little bit of worrisome information um mm -hmm. I don't see anything in the chat, unfortunately. My computer decided to say um, I needed to reboot, <laughs> and um, and it didn't disrupt the program. I um, everything was fine, but it what happens is when I log back in, it deletes the chat for me. So I'm not sure if there was any um, questions in the chat prior to my um, my you know, short departure from the program. Actually, I see, um, I see nothing. I know nothing. <laughs> nothing. Okay. Yeah. The, Cause I, I was, I'm looking at my, um, at when this happened and it happened at 1226 for me. So, um, okay. Well, we, um, I mean, we do have a small group with us today. Um, and that's just because we had to, um, we, oh, we do have a question, but we, we, we're going to have a large group for Thursday. I've, um, <laughs> all right, what do we got here? So I'm wondering about your thoughts on those who choose to opt out of AI versus those who do not. Will this create inequality? That's a really, that's a great thought. Um, good question. Um, Very Pete, good question. What, what are you thinking about that? Very good question. I know a lot of people I talk to will say that I'd rather be there than not there. Maybe I could change the there. Um, by not necessarily falling into those rabbit holes of being so polarized and so on. There's some merit to that argument, but I really think it's not going to work in the end for those who feel that way. As to inequality, we're going to talk about influencers on the next show. And uh, I basically would say, you know, if you're a real influencer, first of all, you don't draw attention to yourself as being an influencer. And a lot of profiles will have that, you know, number one influencer. And it's like the cool people don't say, I'm cool. They know they're cool, right? So if you're a true influencer, why don't you leave, especially if you're complaining about the app, which many are, leave, and your followers should go with you. Prior to all the social media, there were things like websites with comments and various things that were more manageable from an individual person who has opinions as opposed to you don't have any control over the social medias. Why? Because of the algorithm. And the algorithm actually drives conflict. So this is where your question about inequality, I think, has a bit of a problem anyway, because we're not equal inside those programs. In fact, we're very unequal. You could be the only positive voice on a feed and you'd be inundated with negative remarks about you directly. Um, this is the real damage, I think, that's happening with social media. It didn't start out that way. Um, if you think back, I was an early adopter of Facebook. I'm no longer on Facebook. Facebook changed as soon as they brought in the news feed, and the news feed was um, filled with conflicting um, situations where it was designed to raise people's feelings and, and anger and so on. And this was overt. This was planned. This wasn't accidental. I think it ruined the product. I, I no longer could find my friends. I mean, I could find them, but they were never in the feed anymore. It was all this other stuff, and I would... If I saw anything from my friends, it was always two weeks late. So that's just one example. All of them have really turned out to be like that. And it comes down again to the AI and the algorithm. So when we talk equality or inequality, you can't have any equality on the, uh, and you might have found this if you're on them with the number of friends you have, the number of likes you get. I mean, you'd be very lucky if you're getting lots and lots of shares and likes. It's so influenced by pay, people actually pay. Uh, AI to give them likes and follows and shares. And there's a number of gaming of the system. So when someone says they've got a million followers, you have to look at that and say, well, that's a little suspicious. And that's true of even the major celebrities, the politicians, almost anyone who's in that league uh, has got some kind of gaming going on. Most of us would have a circle of friends. You might have whatever, maybe a hundred friends or so on, but how often does that hundred actually like or share? something that you've put up there. It's almost impossible to achieve, and that goes to equality. You are not equal with Canadian Tire or people who are paying for spots on those uh, apps. So I would say back to agency, we need to take our own agency and say, bye, uh, give me something that's better, something that actually is useful to me in terms of 
what I want. Now, maybe you don't agree with me, but what I want from the social media is to be able to connect with my friends directly. I don't want to hear from somebody in the States who's talking about conspiracy theories with the election. The problem, too, is if I happen to read one of those spots, all of a sudden I'm inundated with those spots. Again, it goes back to the algorithm. What equality is in there there? None, really. All of a sudden you're feeding me all this kind of information that I really don't want. And it's pretty hard to stop those feeds. So our involvement in using those tools is really quite limited. And what they're harvesting from us is massive. It goes back to what I was saying before, right? Your demographics, your, even your face and your voice recognition which has repercussions to us from all kinds of things where somebody I call a bad actor could actually replicate through a video, which is a fake video, or even just a phone call. And it could be from a son or daughter saying, I'm in trouble here, I need money from you. And for all intents and purposes, you would think that it's the real person calling. These are the risks that we're going to see unless we somehow say, hold up, this isn't acceptable to us. And I think most of us would accept legislation on that front. And the fines would have to be really, really massive, which is another problem. Often the companies like Google have been hit with fines in the millions of dollars, but it's a drop in the bucket. This is another problem that we face. And by drop in the bucket, I mean they're making trillions of dollars. So if somebody fines them $10 million for uh, using the algorithm improperly, you know, from a business model sense, it's a drop in the bucket. They'll go ahead and do it anyway. This is what we're up against, right? And I think the only way around it is through our government to say, stop, you can't do this. And I like the California proposed law for that reason, because basically we have an opportunity then to be on those apps and close it down and say, I'm just looking for this friend. That's it. You can't take any of the other stuff. That to me is equality because now our relationship with the supplier is at least on an equal basis. And if they say, well, our whole business model is associated with you use the app for free but we get all this data, okay, too bad, so sad, I won't stay there. And we really have to be willing to do that. And unfortunately, if we want to stay on the, uh, on the apps, we can't win. Uh, they're going to harvest our data so completely that this type of use that I demonstrated today will happen. And uh, you may have seen it already just from tracking, where you may be on one of the apps and you're, you're looking at something for vacation. It may be an ad that's come your way. And the next thing you know, on all your websites, you're getting ads for the same thing. People often think it's, it's they're listening to us, but it's not actually listening in a real sense. It's the trackers that when you open up an app and then you go somewhere in your browser, those trackers are following you. And uh, it's all instantaneous in a flash. The, the, if you look at it in kind of like a, a metaphor, it's like little bugs who go around and say, oh, that person's interested in that. Let's send them that. And it's all happening in a flash. That's where we're at with AI right now. And this isn't autonomous AI, not yet. When we get to that stage, and I do believe we will get to that stage, then you've got AI doing it on its own. And who knows what they'll be interested in sending us or dealing with us. I think my theory is what I was saying to Betty, that we won't even be aware of them. They'll be so sophisticated. It'll be like maybe a presence of a ghost. Something might move and we'll not know how that happened, but it's actually some AI independent species activity beyond us. But right now we're not there and here's our moment in time that we can actually control it but it'll only happen if we really as the um popular folks as the person was saying start to reflect on this which is one of my goals i really want you to ponder after this episode and the rest of the episodes and say well what can i do about it you can certainly start talking to your kids if you have them if you're a teacher start dealing with this in class throughout the courses bring it to home ec bring it to math class uh, don't just leave it in a, a science computer technology course. Uh, if you're a minister, preach about it. If you're a mechanic, talk about it in relation to autonomous vehicles, et cetera. We've got to bring it down to our level, and we've got to start articulating uh, an ability to, to recognize it and say we don't want it. And there's lots of opportunities to say that. One of the best ways is just by not buying it. And I know that's really hard to do. I have an iPhone. Uh, I'm still on Instagram. Um, but I'm participating. By that, I mean I'm participating in my own manipulation. I have an awareness that they are collecting data, and I'm somewhat prepared for the consequences of that. But at least I'm making that decision. And I think so many of us aren't. And by the way, in terms of Instagram, Threads, and I'll talk about this on Thursday as well, uh, is a competitor now to X, formerly Twitter. And for people who just jumped on it already, they didn't realize that if they wanted to leave, they'd actually be leaving Instagram as well. And this is where I go into trust again, back to equality. 
it's really not equal standards if they say, well, join our new app and not tell you that if you leave, you're going to also leave the old app. All your contacts go right into threads. And I just think that's not fair game. That's not good business practice. But as of now, that's still legally okay. And I think we could articulate in, if we were really extreme about it, letters to our government, even calls to our government. If you happen to run into one of your MPs or MPPs or counselor, start talking about that. The more they hear about it, the more they'll start to realize that our public really has a feeling about this. And if we don't do it, it's going to happen to us and we won't have any say in it in the future. In other words, we will be in equal. That's a long answer, but um, that's how I feel about your question. That um, that is a that is a long answer for sure. But we could talk. But really, there is no short answer to that. Um, and it and it will probably create inequality. But I think I think over time it could change, right? And I think Keith, you're you're right in that we um, that we we have to be a voice in this in these changes, and um, and express our 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 thoughts and um, and see if if we can actually help make those changes and create good policies or be a part of the policy um, that would be really nice. Uh, I'm really looking forward to when eventually we um, we finally get um, a law in place for artificial intelligence um, here in Canada. Um, Bill C-27, um, whenever that will happen, it will be good. It's not perfect by any means. It's not, but it is a start. The other um, thing about law, by the way, is it, it can be changed. I think the hesitation in making law is that we might not get it right. And that's okay because we can change it, right? And most people would say, too, if you start out more restrictive, you can at least lighten up. But if you start out light, it's much harder to crack down. And the other thing on equity, I think, in terms of right now, it's like this. The companies have all the control. We have to believe we have some agency and bring it back up, insist on it, complain to the app suppliers directly, um, shut down things automatically. And it's the opposite way now. You have to go in and change all the default. So you should should be really proactive and start doing that. At least you're saying something. Mm -hmm. I've... Um... I mean, your your thoughts on on data collection is um, is quite scary, and in, in what is being what is is gathered about us, um, how we are making these companies extremely rich um, with our own data and not really even realizing it. Um, I know now in the news they're they're talking about. Um, you know, these smart cars out in the roads um, that are collecting data that we really don't want out there at all. And there's no about that in episode three, actually. And there's no opt out. Um, mm -hmm. And when will that when will that be created? So mm -hmm. I do I do think that an, an opt out is a is a very a, a good thing. And I don't think everybody will opt out. But um, but I think over time, I think we'll see it grow to um, to to a larger number. But I don't think we'll ever reach 100%, um, unfortunately. Now, I did insert in the chat um, an upcoming digital expo that we're hosting. Um, and Keith will be there um, to, to talk about um, all the good things that he does with Literacy AI. Um, but it's going to be about trustworthy AI, so um, and privacy and all of that. So I did insert a link in the chat um, for those who um, live in Toronto. I do know that um, people attend these programs from all over the world. But if you are in the Toronto area, um, please do um, join us for that um, for that event. And um, and then we do have a. a conversation coming up with um, with a professor from um, from UBC um, in British Columbia. Um, Wendy Wong has just recently written a book on We the Data, Human Rights in the Digital Age, right? And how important that is um, and that human element. Um, we really do need to um, keep 
the human there um, in, in all aspects and how we're going forward. Artificial intelligence is here to stay and it's not going, it's not going to go away. We're never going to eliminate it, but we need to know how we go forward in the future by keeping the human a part of that. I mean, Keith, you did mention um, Alan Davidson, um, you know, the all the bodies in the room creating this lovely policy, of course, missing a key component, which is us, not me and you, but everybody, um, our communities are not a part of the policy. And I think, um, and I, I do think that, um, that for policy making that there should be more consultation sessions that are out there seems to be lacking um, and making that visible and um, and news putting it out there that you know come join us virtually in person or however it'll be right we, we really do need to get that invite and and um, and make a point I think part of the problem, anyway part of the problem there too is is you've got to go where the people are rather than saying come to city hall or whatever that may be more difficult yeah. show up in the shopping mall and uh have have some computers around, talk about data, talk about what the city's doing and ask those questions. You've got to go out and reach. Mm -hmm. uh, because the idea, the old school is that they'll come to us. We'll have a town hall meeting, but it's in the civic center and it's at eight o'clock at night or whatever, or perhaps it's right. in the afternoon. You know, be out in the shopping mm -hmm. mall 24 seven or whatever the hours are of the shopping mall and be there for a couple of weeks. Make it really uh, profoundly detailed as opposed to a two hour meeting with coffee and tea served. It's not good enough. Right, right. I totally agree. <laughs> okay. Well, we have reached our. Um, yeah. We seem to go over a little bit, huh, Keith? <laughs> yeah. Um, because you have so much information, but um, I know that um, that it was uh, a little frustrating getting here today when we got here, and one we down, three we times have one down. Right. Um, we did say that Keith and I did say when when um, everything happened last week, we we're like going to happen right <laughs> three times three times lucky um and so here we are thank you um i i really do appreciate it i hope you show up to thursday's program um i did insert a link into into the chat um this program is recorded even with me having a little glitch and having to to reboot um it was still recording so i'll be i'll be sending that out and um keith as always you've done a fabulous job and i look forward to thursday's program and um and everybody have a great rest of the day and i really do appreciate you taking the time to be here today okay Thank you. Keith, thanks a lot see you thursday thank you okay bye everybody see you bye. soon thank you bye